have to be fitter because the game is over a longer period. And then once you are physically a mini fit, it will assist you in your batting and your performance. As we continue to celebrate the extraordinary legacy of the late Barbadian cricketer Keith Boyce, we follow his journey into the world of cricket, which was nothing short of spectacular. With unwavering dedication, raw talent and a passion that shone bright like the Caribbean sun, Keith Boyce rose to become one of the more iconic figures in the sport. From the cricket fields of the 1960s to the fiercely competitive arena of the 1970s, Keith Boyce's impact was profound. His dynamic performance with the bat and ball mesmerized cricket fans. His son-in-law Bobby Goodman pays tribute to his legacy of a true cricketing icon and remembers the impact he had on international cricket. Certainly I was recalling his, um, his performance during the Prudential World Cup uh, 1975. I was saying that a lot of people don't notice that. Yeah, Clive Lloyd made 102 in 85 balls and, you know, was definitely the man in the match. But apart from that, um, I recall Rohan Kane getting 55 at a, a strike rate about 50 or 52, and Chief Boyce, uh, he got 34 behind number seven, and certainly, the fact that in the Australian innings, they were chasing 291 and fell short by 17 runs, 274, but five Australians were run out. And although the West Indies had Bramble Holder, Bernard Julian, Andrew Roberts as the fast bowlers, uh, the only wickets that fell the bowlers was um, Five Lloyd get him one for 38. Five Lloyd to start his 11th over. And he's bowled it. So that's the wicket West Indies wanted. And that could be the turning point in the game. Walters who looked and gave us a glimpse here of his true form falling to Clive Lloyd. In five moments, we call it was a 60 over game. And Keith Boyce get him four for 50. Boyce too much. Bowled him. And that, I should think, is just about the end for Australia. Marsh, bowled by Boyce, aiming away through mid-on. He made 11, and the... And that must be out. Can I? And he's caught it safely. Just 10 yards in from the boundary. An attempted bouncer from Keith Boyce. And Can I in all sorts of trouble there. Boyce now. It's probably his 12th over to Edwards. And it's in the air, and Fredericks must catch that. A simple chance. And Australia have lost their eighth wicket for 231. The West Indian crowd is going wild over on the left of the ground. Please keep boys. Holder. The fourth run out of the innings. A very fast throw from Holder. I wouldn't mark it down as one of the best pieces of running between the wickets I've ever seen from any cricketer. And Max Walker is out, having turned the ball to Holder. Started off down the pitch. Was sent back by Thompson, who never had any intention of going, and there certainly wasn't a single there. So now we have four run outs in this Australian innings, which stands now at 233 for the loss of nine wickets. And those four wickets obviously were crucial in taking us to victory. But when people review that final, you hardly ever, ever hear about Keith Boyce, because I think, as always, he was taken for granted. One of the two World Cups that we won, one in 75 and one in 79, and you used to see him at large, you know, bowling against Australia. You know, and we, we lifted the cup on that occasion, you know, and you can't get cricket, you boys to sleep. If you think of the 1973 series against England, uh, where he got the most wickets, 19 wickets, I was the man in the series. And he's out. And a little bit unfortunate there, Danny Sam is getting mixed up a little bit in two minds. 
well to let it go or play it in the end, he jumped down and he got on his... Um, I remember the second test. He might have number nine, mid 72. And that's many a mile, an enormous six. Quite an incredible shot there by Keith Boyce. He almost hit it leaning back and it soared into the pavilion here at the Oval. Really a ferocious hitter. And got 11 hits in the game. Chopped it onto the stumps. Boyce's wicket. Second he's taken. He went to Austria and met Ronald Stoll. A lot of West Indians only get hit. I think he made nice, something not out or something so down in Austria. Twice not out. And that's many a mile. An enormous six. For us in the West Indies, we were probably happy. We should not have been surprised, however. And certainly in the, in the UK, they weren't surprised because this was a man who eventually scored 8,800 first class runs and took 852 first class wickets. Keith Boyce went to the UK um, around the age of 18. Um, having left school not too long before. And in his first first class match, uh, he got nine wickets for 61 runs. Very first first class match. I always say it was a pity that his test career started in 1971. There's a rumor, and I, I don't have any way of proving it, but um, although I'm so sorry, Sir Garfield told me that never happened. But there is a rumour that Sir Gary tried to um, convince the selectors that he should be in the West Indies team a long time before he actually um, became a West Indies player, even though his first class career started in 1966. And um, he was really outstanding, you know? In the early stages, there were some other phenomenal records. Um, like taking 12 wickets in a match in which he scored the fastest century, I think, in 58 years in the UK uh, against Leicester. And in that game, same game, he got 12 wickets for 73 runs. A fantastic bowler too. I didn't mention his ability to bowl. He bowled fast, medium and slow. He was fantastic. There were so many things that went unnoticed. He was the first cricketer in the UK, in John Perrine, the first person to a hundred wickets and a thousand runs. And when you're the first in something like that, that's the record that's unmissable. He was in the Guinness Book of Records for taking eight wickets and 26 runs. And these things didn't just climb into my head after I married his daughter. As a little fella, I was a chief voice for that, so, you know, I was reading the same thoughts and it was just me stuck in my memory. When you look back at what his participation in international cricket and then you look at what he did in county cricket, it was very rare, certainly in my time, to have someone from these, this part of the island representing our flag with distinction. And uh, you only have to hear from the people at, uh, in Essex uh, what they thought of, of Keith Boyce and they still talk about it. I had the pleasure of visiting Essex with my dad a year in England and we were mobbed. Mm -hmm. I could not even find him because people, it was just announced that he was there and everyone came rushing. I can't believe it that people would remember him like that we would have gone into stores and people recognized him and, you know, offered him, you know, stuff in the, especially in the sports stores and stuff like that. And it was amazing that people remembered my dad. It was like, okay, he's my dad, so I'm not thinking he is so widely known, but, you know, it was amazing, both here and overseas. You know, so 
yes, he was a giant as far as we were concerned, but I think more importantly, his memory lives on and people are still talking about him in this day and age. Well, I got a scholarship and I went overseas on track and field. And when I came back, Keith was back home too. I took up four sack coach in private school coaching. And Keith was back in Barbados working with the BCA. In uh, 1996, when I joined the BCA board, again, I was the youngest man on the board, or almost the youngest. Keith was on the board. I remember first two meetings, I didn't say anything or very little. And one night after the meeting was finished, he said, young man, you don't talk. <laughs> so I said, yeah. But I virtually am. Um, just you know, following how the meetings go and so on. Because at that time, you had people like um, Charlie Griffith, now Sir Charles Griffith, Wayne Estwick, Cammy Smith, Tony Marshall. People, my seniors and so on. I suppose when I joined the board, I would have been a youngster to the other people. And he paid interest in me. And the most prophetic thing he ever told me, though, was he said, what is there? You can become president. Because now you're talking. You know, you're talking development and things like that. But um, at the level of the board, he was a sort of inspiration because he always had ideas about development. And that, that's the part that caught me in terms of, like, you know, ensuring that we would get a strong Barbados and the 19 team. In those days, they didn't have the under 15s and under 17s. And we did very well. And um, also our senior team. And, um, but then, you know, he was playing for Essex, I think it was in the competition, so he'd be away and he would come back. Always paying an interest in in, um, in development of the younger cricketers, Courtney Browns and those guys like that. I think he started the uh, the, the lottery. He used to work with the lottery with um, it was uh, Lashley then. Then he offered to coach the um, what we call back then the combined schools. Um, and I could see you now some Saturdays he would have he had a sabru, a maroon sabru, and that car would be filled with the team. I don't know how he could get so many boys in that car. But that was the man, you know, he, he took an interest in the youth. Uh, I feel like Corey Cullimore, the later stages, um, Kirk Edwards, the guys from down that side, and um, who also played in the combined schools, you know. So he was always about giving back, and he chose to work with the combined schools where I was working. So I was the manager and he was the coach. And every Saturday, you know, we would just be together. When he came back to Barbados, he was coach of Schools North and he was a manager. So he had a chance to speak at length. I'll never forget, he told me, if you want to be a good cricketer, you have to be able to climb trees because trees give you balance. And the higher you go, the more you have to balance. And I thought that was phenomenal. I've never heard it before. He said, but you know, as you go up a tree, you've got to get on your toes you have to balance properly. And if you cannot balance, you can't be a good batsman. That, that was <laughs> a lesson. And um, one of the venues for practice for the combined school, North was coaching high school. And so our relationship continued. And when he realized that I was into the coaching at coaching high school, he supplied me with a lot of literature on coaching from, I think it was the National Coaching Program in England. And I benefited a lot too from that support. And I went on as a result of that to do the West Indian Advanced Cricket Coaching course. I remain very close with Keith. Um, I'm going to, I'm not going to get into how, how close we were, lest I become very emotional, because um, believe it or not, he, he, we, were, we were very close. Keith Boyce was my first um, formal coach. Uh, at the time, formal coach was not as popular as it, was not, as it is now. And he coached me uh, from that time, 1973, I think or so. He coached me as a, I think as a nine-year-old boy, and then he returned to Cornish Parry. He would always find time to give back, give back to the school. Um, when I was in second form, when I was in fourth form, fifth form. He'd be away and he would come back, always paying an interest in, in um, the development of the younger cricketers, Courtney Browns and those guys like that. I 
I'm not sure if Keith was even paid for, for coaching uh, um, some of these sessions. I think he volunteered a lot of his time to assist, to help out um, boys, to help out the school. Um, and what is always, what I always remember is that the time um, he used to have one gear bag. But that gear bag um, for Corish Party School at the time was Mark KD Boyce. I think what people refer to um, as a coffin, a coffin, um, the way it was shaped. Um, he took the last one, he, the last tour I think he had to Australia. I think Australia was his last tour, yeah? 1975, 1976, and he donated it to the school. And we used that as a gear bag for as long as I knew myself playing at Corish Party. So again, he gave, he gave us time, he gave us talent, he gave us effort to, to the school and to people. And when they came back to live, I was kind of helping them to select the home in Rockland the Park. In Rockland the St. Michael, I helped them select the home. And I took Kathy to Miss Lee Cox. And I told Miss Lee Cox, who is my godmother, this is my best friend's daughter, and I want her in school. And Miss Lee Cox said, no problem, no money. So, so Kathy, which is Keith's first daughter, would have gone to Miss Lecott's school. And I, I am not sure that she passed for Corrigan Party. I, I think we took her in that Corrigan Party too, <laughs> because she was Keith Boy's daughter. And um, I, remember, I remember when we purchased the furniture for the house in Rotten Park. It came from, it came from Courts in Bridgetown. And funny enough, one crazy friend of ours, a guy by the name of Ackles, was doing the transportation of the furniture, driving as he normally does. And when he bent the corner, Keith and the furniture almost, almost ended in the road. So we had a, we had a, a close um, rapport through the edges. Um, afterwards, the government of Barbados organized a uh, coaching clinic for all of the schools in St. Peter, both primary and secondary, and I think some of St. Lucie also. And um, this was played at the Quarish Party Grounds at the time. So this is where I first met Keith Boyce. At the time I was a, a budding fastball of some sort. Um, I don't know what Keith saw, but he was responsible for changing, turning me into a spinner. I don't know what, what was the reason, but um, he had a, a knife for cricket. My fondest memories of Keith, um, the first time I ever saw a googly being bowled, um, he taught the class that I was in how to bowl a googly. Well, cricket being my first love as a kid growing up, uh, I would have heard about Keith Boyce and with his exploits of playing cricket for Barbados and then for West Indies. And to have the pleasure of meeting him, being from my alma mater. Uh, obviously, I took some pride and joy knowing that Keith Boyce was a, a CPO scholar. And to make it even better, he ended up being one of my coaches at school. So you can imagine what it was like. This person I had in my mind and hearing about him and seeing him on the cricket field representing West Indies, then to be actually in the same ear as this legend as far as we were concerned and then to be able to benefit from his experience and stuff of playing a sport that I love and that really started the relationship with Keith Boyce where he, he after he completed his stint for West Indies he gave back to the community, gave back to his school and then as my elevation came about in cricket it was part and parcel uh, attributed to some of the experience and knowledge that Keith Boyce would have shared with me. And then he went into administration again. We had some association with the combined schools and stuff like that. So we, we always had some connection all the way through. And when I revisit it, you know, I probably had more of an appreciation. Probably I was slightly overwhelmed when it was going on as a kid to have this, uh, this legend sharing his experience with me. And then as I got older, I really was able to appreciate the benefits of him sharing 
that with me and, and we had discussions earlier a lot of what he said to me as a boy stayed with me which I use in my my own coaching and my own development as a player I was able to use some of the ideas and some of the opinions that he would have shared with me and it's always satisfying when you can actually put it into practice so you hear about it it's gospel because it's coming from those lips but when you can actually see it come into fruition it makes it even more valuable and that in essence really encapsulates my relationship with Keith Boyce and my opinion of Keith Boyce. The first thing was as you know he was an explosive type cricketer and back then it was probably the way we played our cricket so he was able to bring a balance as to how you can be explosive and entertaining but at the same time effective so it wasn't a case of a one-shot wonder you know you could hit the ball as far as anybody else but how often do you hit it and he probably educated me on the importance of shot selection so whereas you know what you can do but it's to do it at the right time and he also would have taught me in terms of bowling because then when I went to play in the UK I was able then to remember some of the things he told me something as simple as you know how we turn the shine around when you're playing in the West Indies which has now commonly been referred to as reverse swing <laughs> we were actually taught that as kids right so it's not a, a reinvention of the wheel this we were taught a long time ago so when I went to Ireland that stuck with me and I remembered exactly what I had to do to become effective so that's just one part of the skills I, I I think I tried to mirror my style on him as well so I sort of fancied myself as a bit of a an ag aggressive batsman I like to hit sixes as well and again he with our school ground was a small ground and he was always clear to say to me you can hit a six on any ground don't just get drawn in to the shorter side All right so your skills stick with your skills and he always told me about percentages what was the importance of trying to hit the ball as straight as often you are likely to create or commit less errors in trying to play straight so those are the two technical points that stayed with me from a batting perspective and from a bowling perspective I would have seen his his style of management and that father figure aspect of it was part and parcel certainly as a youngster growing up um, Pedro Hines who you would speak to as well was or mentor at school so we really associate we were associated with that sort of father figure concept and it wasn't just what went on during the practice sessions or on the field of play it was actually teaching you about life and Keith Boyce was from that elk as well that after the game or after the training session you then sat there in awe as he told you about experience told you about life like the things that he had gone through or what you can expect um, people saw Keith really as a cricket coach and he was a cricket coach great coach but Keith Boyce was more of a, a friend even to those um, who he coached um, can attest to the fact that he became more of a mentor more of a friend more so of a coach um, if I had to list um, those people who would have been influential in my cricket career then um, Keith Boyce would have been right up there um, probably the first two, probably, you know, probably number one, um, both from coaching itself and advice. Um, from any perspective, Keith Boyce had an influence on my, on my life, on my career. Um, Keith, I, well, I played with him um, in some of the old boys game, man, because we share the same alma mater and, um, I always look forward to him playing what is called the, the old boys game. I don't think you can call it so, no. Um, but he took the time out after games to share with us um, of his experiences, um, um, advice, and that is something we look forward to. So again, he, he was more of a friend, a mentor, more so than a coach. Great man. Again, that worked for me because I was going into a foreign country to play my trade. I was the only black person for about 60 miles. So a lot of 
things that he would have either shared with us or told us what you can expect as a professional cricketer. Again, we saw a lot of that unfolding and it probably equipped us a little bit better to deal with those challenges and uh, basically how to be ambassadors and that was another important thing because the I mean cricket was the one thing that marketed the West Indies at that point in time so when you went overseas you became an ambassador for Barbados, an ambassador for black people, an ambassador for cricketers so you had that responsibility and you inherited it so it was a, it was a case as, as a father figure he had been through it he would have seen the pitfalls and you were advised of those pitfalls in cricket and in life. So day-to-day -day life, he also would have been one of those persons inclined to take on that responsibility. And as you said, it didn't matter whether you had a father or a f another father figure, he saw that as his role as it related to cricket. And after cricket, you still had to live. You still had a life to live. He gave everybody roles and he, he set a, a benchmark, I would say, for leadership. Even so, we think of leadership in a, in a cricket unit, especially as maybe you have a hierarchy of managers and coaches and captain and so on. But how we understand it now as an adult, he, he let everybody lead in their role. And I say that because even in our preparation after practice on evenings, we would have our team meetings, we would sit after the, the practice sessions and talk, and everybody had to talk about how they see the practice went, what are their plans for the weekend, for the game coming, how they see it turning out and so on. And even in the game, we would do the same thing for um, in the intervals, as we break for lunchtime, before we go back out, we would grab our bite, we would plan again in the intervals. And everybody had to say well, how they saw the last session going, was the plan, how they see the plan executing in the coming session. And again, at the end of the day. And so there was no hiding. You, you, you were given a role, you knew your role, and you had to say how you saw not only your role, but what you thought happened during the day and so on. So I thought that was important for leadership. His coaching role on, on, on the field, I guess, is most visible, and we talk about that. What we can't really see, or unless you were there, was the interest in, like you said, the, the personal development of young men. Um, I think we grew as a family more so than a team and we talk about the cricket team of Kamalini Schools North but there were boys practicing around that team who probably didn't make the team consistently or didn't make the team at all already but they all felt as part of a family and the development to me came from just him passing on knowledge he passed on knowledge on his past playing career experiences he would have had going we, we've talked about the punctuality aspect. He always told stories about that. He said in his 13 years of playing professional in Essex, he was late once. He was late for the pickup. I was left and never again was he late. So things like that he passed on to us as boys. Um, I think he also took an interest in us more than the cricket player. He needed to know what was going on in our lives, in our school life, in our home life, because he had this, he had this saying that um, well, you can't perform if, if you're not right, you know. You need to know if, if somebody is struggling otherwise and so on, so you can address it to get the performance out of it. And I thought that was important as well. Keith Boyce's story does not end here. He was not only a force to be reckoned with on the cricket pitch, but also a symbol of resilience, sportsmanship, and unity. His indomitable spirit made him that beloved figure who transcended boundaries. I'm Sherwood McCaskey.